And we are back with an all new Keep It. I'm Ira Madison III. I'm Louis Fertel, and I'm so pleased to report that someone finally matched my freak. <laughs> I cannot get that song out of my head. Last week we uh, brought up Tanache's new song and how, you know, it's probably gonna chart and it's gonna be a big moment for her. Anyway, in this song, Nasty, and by the way, we celebrate the history of Nasty on record from Janet Jackson oh, to Vanity course. Sex on back, forward, and to the future. But anyway, the uh, is someone gonna match my freak lyric and is so hitting me hard. It, it's so robotically delivered and yet precisely in a pop music, mm -hmm. melodic, brain wormy way. Now, sort of a force to be reckoned with for the summer. And I say this because I believe I have overplayed espresso. Yeah, yeah. Um, I feel like we were maybe a bit too optimistic last week with espresso dominating the entire summer because it has significantly dropped on my on repeat on Spotify because, and I say significantly, like it's it's number five uh, okay. underneath <laughs> the underneath the stereophonic soundtrack. Two songs from that, Bodyguard from Beyonce, still up there. Um, 360 by Charlie XCX and also Nasty, but Nasty has held its place at number three for weeks. It was number one at one point, but it keeps bouncing up there. I love how I'm talking like I'm the charts. I'm the I was say, no, you're like your Ryan Seacrest. <laughs> yeah, the top 40 or Dick Clark or something. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But I think we neglected to really dive into how fantastic this Tanasha song is last week. And it's truly one of her best songs in recent memory. And it is so hypnotic and so like it gets stuck in your head. I'm just like, just like the whole chorus, I've been a nasty girl. Like it's just in my head all day. No, right. And I mean, it's delivered hypnotically. Like it's almost like like the, the pendulum on a clock swinging back and forth as she just sort of drums this into you. It's like a Poe story, really. Um, <laughs> but I, no, I'm, I'm, I'm psyched for Tanache, who, again, my theory was she was trapped at WeHo Pride and actually couldn't find her way out from under the stage. <laughs> Sort of like M. Night Shyamalan's new movie, Trap, starring Josh Hartnett, which I cannot wait to see, even though I feel like we got the entire movie in the trailer. Right. Yeah. Or, or you know, like Jasmine in the Hourglass in Aladdin. That was sort of her, except she was next to like the, the Mountain Dew fag stage at in We Hot Pride. Wearing the same outfit as Jasmine as yeah, well. Right. Yeah. By the way, ja <laughs> Jafar's taste in that scene, spicy. I mean, he was like, she's going to well, be a whore today. Well, speaking of WeHo Pride, I mean, there's 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 no <laughs> bigger sign there's no bigger sign that Jafar is uh, faggot coded like most of Disney's villains. Hello, right. Scar. Um, then the fact that Jasmine is wearing that outfit while trapped in the hourglass is giving. Okay, Jasmine's your pop diva. We no, right. It. Nicole Scherzinger, the house down boots. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, I would I would love a Jafar origin story about yes. his oh my conflicted God. sexuality. That's and something way, that's actually yeah. interesting. A prequel we want. Yeah, that's what I was say. Guys, you're going to give us every other prequel. I'm sure we're going to learn, like, you know, where Iago and his cage-free eggs came from. I have no idea. <laughs> but, like, Jafar, that would be fascinating. <laughs> Uh, what ghetto those um, black crows from Dumbo came from? Yep. <laughs> Shucking and jiving. <laughs> Dumbo is from just Detroit. one of the most troubling experience, <laughs> experiences ever. I mean, it's an amazing movie and also just the nerve. <laughs> uh. Also, the bitch barely flies. Right. And oh, no, he's not that good at flying elephant. I'll say it. Yeah. There was also a tweet someone had recently about... Um, about those haters in Dumbo. What are they, the other elephants or something? They're nasty as hell <laughs> to Dumbo's mother. Like, a actually, the thing about Dumbo is every character that Dumbo encounters in that movie is a cunt. <laughs> Which they don't get into in the live action version that had fucking Danny DeVito in it. Am I remembering that right? Yeah. We just back up the money train movie. to these character actors' house and they're like, can you just be animated with this fucking elephant for a little while, please? It was it was very great as showman coded and yeah uh, right. and focus much more on the circus and these human characters than Dumbo. But how do you get into the interiority of a CGI elephant? 
<laughs> when we hack that one day, I, I mean, I hope <laughs> Disney Labs is on this. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I also want to tell, say something about last week. I was recording. The police were outside and I could see like a growing police population outside my apartment. And um, I was wondering, am I going to be here next week? Uh, <laughs> but I went downstairs after we finished recording to smoke a cigarette and I could not get out of my apartment. It was there was a barricade in front of my apartment door. And I'm thinking, is Ghostface running around? Like, well, right. what is happening? Were and your takes too hot? I've, right. There's lots, right. Of, lots of suspicion in the air. But my neighbor was downstairs waiting, too. She was like, I can't get to work today. And I was like, well, what's going on? And she said, Kamala Harris is eating across the street at a restaurant. Now, I'm not going to mention the name of the restaurant because we're talking about the Billie Eilish album this week. And she has a song about a stalker. And if I tell you the name of this restaurant, you will know exactly where I live. So I will not. But it's a bad restaurant. And I was concerned for the VP. Oh, it's yeah. a taste dish. Well, the, I was concerned for you because in order to get to work, you almost had to climb out a window and literally fall out of a coconut tree to get into your place <laughs> of employment. <laughs> Uh, it would, I would love um, for someone to actually fall out of a coconut tree in front of her. Uh, wouldn't that be so adorable in like a, a, yeah. a Sunny from Cocoa Puffs kind of way? You know, like a real cartoony. <laughs> now Get I've her done it. in a Cocoa Puffs commercial. Okay, that's what I want. That's what I really want from Kamala Harris. I, this whole running the country shit for her. I, I don't think her heart's in it. Our heart's not in it. Give her a talk show. <laughs> Okay, right. she like let her be Drew Barrymore. Don't you don't you want to see Kamala interviewing people just chuckling it up on a couch every day? You don't want to see more of Drew Barrymore like feeling her up like a like a game of blind man's bluff because that was just shocking. Yeah, like I every mean, part of that pantsuit was touched. I mean, <laughs> intimate apparel. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh Honestly, what Michelle Buteau said last week, though, about Drew did sort of remind me. I mean, this is a woman who grew up in the industry from a child, and we know all of the dark things that Drew went through. Uh, oh, yeah. Read it's well her chronicled. Out of print yes. memoir. Um, but her on her show, plus the old the videos of her in the rain and being excited by it and the TikToks, things like that, you have to imagine that, yes, she has reverted to the childhood that she's never had. And if you think about Drew Barrymore in that respect, then it all makes sense. Right. No, I applaud her for having an indomitable spirit. But sometimes spirits should be dominable and you should come back down to earth. Um, Where are the Ghostbusters? Yeah, right. <laughs> oh, my God. We did a sketch on Kimmel last week that ended with a Ghostbusters button. And Guillermo, like, collects the ghost and whatever, whatever those things are called in Ghostbusters. And then he goes, Bustin' makes me feel good, which is, of course, a lyric in the Ray Parker Jr. song. What fucking planet were we on where Bustin' makes me feel good got to exist? <laughs> were, were, were there any adults on this picture? Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, first of all, you did not have a Ghostbusters trap as a kid. I did. I just don't know what the thing is called. I know it has like the black and yellow lines on it. Yeah. Yeah. I, I Do mean, not put this in the gonna... comments. I am not oh. interested in the discussion. <laughs> I want to say the Ecto-1, but isn't that the name of the car? Yes. Right. Right. The, yeah. There's something plasmic. Girl, I'm not going there. I know. I, I in this age of pop culture jeopardy, I should have that at the tip of my tongue, but I don't. Yeah. I used to love hitting that button. Like oh, yeah. stamping your foot on it to open it up, imagining ghosts were there as a kid. That was that was the Ghostbusters delight of toys. We've talked about it on this show before, but they were they were top tier. Oh the, yeah, that I had trap, all of them. Yeah, the car, the whole the um, firehouse, w which had um, holes at the top so you could pour goo down it, which came out after Ghostbusters two. The whole Vigo thing, love those toys. Oh yeah, no, I mean. To say nothing of the fact that you could get all the boy toys and then, you know, secretly to fill out the collection in case you were maybe interested, you could also get the Janine Annie Potts toy. And I would, you know, maybe cherish that toy a little bit more than the others. And, all you know, now I don't have to buy the Barbies. I have a Janine toy. So she's sort of like an even better Barbie, but no one knows that I'm playing with Barbies in the middle of the boy toys. I have a lot mm. of unrealized trauma. <laughs> have I not talked about this? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> That's your what was I made for? Yes. Right? Yeah. 
<laughs> me touching the Annie Potts toy and being like me. Yeah. You know who you know who used to visit the Ghostbusters firehouse a lot? April from Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. Oh, she absolutely had the time. They became fast friends. <laughs> Please. They're like, should we go to lunch? Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of toys and Barbie, Billy Eilish's album came out this week, and I'm excited to talk about it. Me too. Uh, I, I don't, of course, with her, she's such a gifted artist. And yet also seemingly has a signature sound. I didn't know if she'd be straying from that at all. To, uh, how, how new this thing would be. Very thrilled to get into it. Mm -hmm. And also, Back to Black came out this week. Uh, the Amy Winehouse biopic. And I will be um, looking to Lewis for guidance on this because <laughs> I fell asleep in that movie. Oh, my God. <laughs> You'll never make it in the Ebert business. <laughs> I the saw bio the last show we'll last it. night. Oh yeah, <laughs> and it like probably was the last show. So there you go. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> and I definitely passed out. The credits were playing uh, after I saw about the first fifteen minutes or so. I didn't even know I was that fucking tired. But I also looked up screenings tomorrow, and they uh, there are less screenings than there were this weekend. Let's just put that. That out does there. seem. Correct. That does seem correct. Well, I will. I, was I will be the only one in, in my analysis. Yeah, yeah. There weren't many in mine either, and I was at the Grove, where people I think just live. <laughs> so I don't. They had the time. Yeah. Uh, so we will get into that and back to black Twitter. We will go because <laughs> Princess. <laughs> I think that's something that's the very return to Oz about that. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think that's the episode title. Back to black Twitter. Okay. Done. Uh, but we will be joined by Princess Penny, who directed Black Twitter, A People's History, the Hulu documentary, uh, which was just recently released, which I am a talking head in. Uh, I think I'm always so thrilled when you're giving everybody insight. I'm sure that's very helpful to all involved. <laughs> I'm a talking head every week on this. No, yeah. <laughs> T t a yapping head, actually, but <laughs> I was actually thinking about podcasts. Of course, I mean we do one, and I was thinking about when we started, right? And for those who remember the early days of Keep It, um, we used to record video before, but it was Spotify used to come in and record right. video of us, and it was it felt weird uh, to be recording it because it only appeared on like the Spotify app if you went and looked at um, our, our video there. But now it is so commonplace for every single podcast to be recorded, like people just watching little talk shows yeah. every day. Um, anyway. no, And also, by the way, like Hot Ones, that interview show, is yeah. eligible now for, I believe, the real Emmy for talk. So mm. it's like everything's bleeding together now. It's getting a little amorphous out there. I did not know that. That's interesting. Yeah. Okay. I want to say that on uh, SNL, there was a parody of um, Hot Ones recently where uh, uh, Maya Rudolph played Beyonce. They did not nail the impression of that guy. That guy has a real cadence that could have gotten into him. I'm a little disappointed in SNL for that. Oh. Well, it's over for <laughs> the season. So they won't, yeah. Yeah, it's, yeah. Over for the, it's over for the season, so they won't see your letter. Jake Gyllenhaal was great. What a fabulous performance he gave. Get him back on Broadway. Yeah. Also, what a handsome man. He's a handsome devil. Yeah. Um, all right. We ready to start this show? All right. Whatever. Yeah. We'll be right back with more Keep It. Billie Eilish finally dropped her third album, Hit Me Hard and Soft, last weekend. Uh, there's a lot to get into here, but the headline is she's been fucking. <laughs> yeah. And she might be the only person who could convince Gen Z that having sex does not make you an instrument of Satan. I have to say, they are deeply puritanical. I mean, these they're flying right out of the Westboro Baptist Church. These sex scenes aren't necessary, they said. <laughs> but they saw Goody Eilish eating that girl for lunch. <laughs> and maybe, maybe they'll change some things up now. Uh, this album is, it's interesting that this album appears sort of in the vein of how albums had been being released by Beyonce and um, sort of Taylor recently, and that it, it arrived without any lead single. Yeah, you know, right. it just sort mm -hmm. of dropped. 
Um, and so we did not know what to expect from this era. Like you brought up, we were like, was she going to switch up the sound? Was it going to be different? But no, it's just her and Phineas back in the stew. Yep. So keeping it, it is moody. her signature sound. Yeah, keeping it moody, keeping it. Uh, you're listening to a song, and then all of a sudden, um, there's a completely different beat happening, and the song goes in a different direction. Uh, I really like this album, and I think that it is her best work. I think it's an album of the year winner. I'm worried for Cowboy Carter. Yeah. I, I'm, of course, not worried for the Tortured Poets. I hope oh, they enjoy okay. their time in Engl- English 1A or whatever class. <laughs> but um, yeah. this album is phenomenal. I mean, like, she's always been good with lyrics. The lyrics, to, to me, took three steps up here. Like, the, the narratives of each song uh-huh. are so interesting. I mean, let's talk about Lunch, which did become the first single. First of all, I really enjoy the video, which is this sort of blurry 90s-ish thing that Billy herself directed. Mm. I think it's a really cool... She, she She's always been so aesthetically realized. Like, nothing about her has ever been half-assed in terms of how she looks, which obviously... Looks are not the most important thing about a musical artist, but it's like to see someone so assured in what they are delivering and also so not contrived, great. It's just like, oh, you're a fully formed artist. It's not like we're waiting for you to evolve into some artist. Like you're already there. You already have the two fucking Oscars. It's actually frightened how accomplished she is. But this lunch <laughs> song, yeah, I think it is um, a little bit of a musical departure for them that it sounds to me a little bit like gorillas. Um, you know, it's got mm, that kind of like yeah. that thump to it. That's, uh, you know, which obviously a song like Bad Guy has too, but to me this has a little bit more of like a a groove within the thump that uh, is just fabulous, and the lyrics are so good. Well, that actually reminds me that Billy wa- did Feel Good Inc. with the Gorillas at Coachella, yes. around, I believe, 2022, and her album Happier Than Ever came out in 2021, and so I feel like we have not, seen a lot of Billy actually since then. She popped up for the Barbie song um, and some other things, but she sort of drops that, does the promo for it, gets the Oscar, and then leaves. You know? Like we had no idea what she was sort of working on. And now seeing um, that this song sounds very gorillas ish you know, maybe she was influenced a bit by that. Uh, I like where her sound is going. I like seeing her and Phineas sort of develop um, new ways to tell their same stories. And you're absolutely right how realized she is as an artist, only in the sense that when she first started out, and she comments on it, you know, too, she in the song Skinny, uh, talks about how she liked the old self, but she's skinnier now. Do, do you like me now that, like, I sort of look, quote-unquote, prettier? Um, but when she first started out, she was obviously wearing sort of like the baggy clothes and she had a whole commentary on how she wanted people to perceive her. But then we've seen her sexy and glam on magazine cover since that. And then there was the whole sort of um, 50s Hollywood glam look in the What Was I Made For video and sort of those performances. And now she's back to this sort of... um, Swag. I'm going to the warp. T- yeah, swag. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she's always had a swag about her, to be honest. Like, she just seems cool and interesting. And I don't know. She's one of my favorite pop stars, to be honest. And I, I just love how assured she is on this album. I love the lyrics. I love the narratives. When Specifically, when you talk about the narratives on each song, they don't sound muddled. They don't sound repetitive. They sound... They're interesting things that she's singing about. I love the song Wildflower, um, where she is talking about um, consoling, a, consoling a girl um, because she's breaking up with a man, and then now she's dating this man, and she can't stop thinking about uh, you know the other girl crying on her shoulder. Like Even a story like that is interesting. I love her stalker song at the end of the album, The Diner. Uh, every... Just... I can't pinpoint which one I like the best because I just, I just really love this album. And I love how it feels like a full album. She talked about how she wanted to make a album album, sort of like Coldplay's Viva La Vida um, or Vince Staples' Big Fish. And um, it feels like an album. You start this album and you want to listen to the entire thing. It doesn't feel like they're, it's a random collection of songs. I also feel like... I think we are used to thinking of Billie Eilish as somebody who her form or her music has a transformative quality where it's like, oh, music is changing and this is the future. I like on this album, this song Birds of a Feather, where I would almost call it like a conventional pop song in certain ways. Like even the lyrics, I would even say are kind of Taylor-ish, you know, but I like mm-hmm. hearing her do something conventional because she is not conventional. So to hear her mm-hmm. sing up 
traditional pop song is still something we haven't heard before because her version of, of vocals. And by the way, I also love how she slow rolled us on how good a vocalist she is. Not that she was ever hiding it, but of course, the murmuring, the um, the kind of sinister vibe she was going for, it was never a belt on purpose. Like she was going for a different sonic quality. But now with these like, like the soaring melody on uh, Birds of a Feather and the way she can kind of sing it and... Um, release a more emotional quality in, or a different emotional quality in her music. It's just cool. It's like she keeps revealing talents in a way. There are certain people who, when they release a new album, I don't know how they're going to sound vocally. Like they specifically change it up. Somebody I think of in this way, and I've never thought to compare her to P, uh, to um, Billy before, is PJ Harvey. When PJ Harvey comes out mm. with an album, sometimes you get the howling PJ Harvey. Sometimes you get the um, the murmuring, like I'm in the attic and I'm wearing a crinoline gown and it's Victorian era and I have a dead child. You know, there's lots of different vo- versions of her voice she does, <laughs> but you never know. And that's part of the artistry is not just what can I do sonically with instruments to make this sound different, but I can be different. I can be a different performer and have a different persona even. It's sort of why you like artists in general, right? You know, actors do this all the time, and specifically directors and writers. You think of someone like a Martin Scorsese, right, who's known for his um, gangster crime films, etc. But then when he does a film like Age of Innocence, or he does something like Kundun or Silence, it it informs that story because you already know who he is. As yeah, an right. And I do like the work that she's done with Phineas on this. It feels, um, I want to say. Not a criticism of the album, but sort of a um, hope for the future. Um, it feels like she's reached a pinnacle with Phineas mm-hmm. yeah, with this right. album. It feels like her best album, their most fully realized sound and their POV. And now I'm interested in seeing what another producer could pull out of her. Mm. Because, I mean, I think the Pitchfork review, um, which I hate it, but they, it did bring up an interesting point. Um about the albums that she said she was sort of emulating, like making an album, album. Um, Coldplay's Viva La Vida was very much them switching up their sound and working with Brian Eno. And um, Vince Staples' Big Fish was very much him working with Sophie, you know? And so I would love to see just what another producer could get out of Billy besides just Phidias. Because I know we, it's interesting. We know what he sounds like without her. Right, yes. Um, we, we, his, he had his album and... I'm interested in him sort of developing that sound a bit more too because it wasn't as successful to me as them working together. But it, it sounds a little proto um I don't say this derogatorily because I love Glee, but Glee, but a little bit like Ben Platt, a little bit musical theaterity. And I think that I would love to see him explore that as an artist, and I would love to see her explore her vocal ability working with another producer, lest we have a sort of um Taylor Swift um, working with Jack Antonoff thing all the time, you know, too, or even sort of like a Charlie XCX working with A.G. Cook all the time, which I've started to feel a bit on this album. Brat, which I also think feels like it's going to be a pinnacle of her work with A.G., um, just sort of their partnership, and I'm really sort of, sort of interested in people switching it up and moving on to other producers, and that takes me back to what you said about Cowboy Carter, right? I, I was texting uh, my friend Carter um, this weekend, and I said, fuck. <laughs> Beyonce wouldn't want to be in her shoes right now. <laughs> <laughs> They're both. And, which and, is, uh, yeah. <laughs> That's right. They're boots. And she is walking around. She is probably the one stalking Billy at the diner um, in her ominous cowboy hat, right. to be honest. Uh, it's just everywhere. Saloon now. doors but swinging I, open. Yeah, <laughs> It is going to be interesting to think about the upcoming Grammy battle because it is sort of a battle of two things that I feel like Grammy voters constantly fight about. I think that Beyonce's album is so interesting because of – the blend of American sounds and genres and the different producers that she worked with. That's the same reason why I thought Renaissance was so successful. The amount of producers and samples and influences brought in versus this album where it's really just her and Phineas in the studio and it's a singular vision, you know? It's it's so it's so annoying actually and I feel like suffocating the way that there's always this commentary on well it has to be one way for it to be real art. You know, and I, I I like both versions. I also think 
I, I mean, it's it's so hard to compare music and, and saying like one is better or whatever. But the situation with Beyonce is so fraught. And so we clearly think most Grammy categories are bullshit. You know, like we're like, OK, mm-hmm. that's so nice that she got these like other ones, these le- these like uh, 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 bronze colored gr- uh, Grammys that are off to the side. But we want her to get this one gold one. And so it's like I feel bad that she will be up against Billie Eilish because it's like they are incompar- incomparable albums. And when we talked to- about um, Amy Winehouse later, I was like, why did Back to Black not win Album of the Year? And it's because it lost to River the Joni Letters by Herbie Hancock. Now, Herbie Hancock is a genius. We all know Rocket by Herbie Hancock, that weird video with the robots and the NU jazz crazy sounds. I don't know if he needed album of the year for this. I feel like Back to Black was the definitive landmark album of that year. Back to Black is more like a stamp for that time. Like, you know what I mean? If if you went back, you would probably say that was album of the year. So, um, yeah, Herbie was not fully loaded. No, okay, so uh, <laughs> not at that time. Not at that time. No, <laughs> this wasn't Rocket era Herbie Hancock. Um, but uh, no, I I feel bad for Billie Eilish. In fact, that she will be up against Beyonce because that's just not a narrative. I'm sure she cares to be a part of in that way. And she, of course, already has an album of the year win, which makes it like a Taylor situation or like an Adele situation, where these people who are uh, up against Beyonce and in fact have already taken this crown. Um, are at it again. And let's not forget that Billy had her own Adele moment at the Grammys before where she um, shouted out Megan the Stallion. Right. Yes, yes, yes. At the, was, that was one of those weird yeah. quarantine Grammys, wasn't it? Yeah. yeah that, I hated that Grammy. Although it did look nice. It was on the roof. Yes, but it did feel like you were at somebody's wedding. Yeah. <laughs> Like, I can see too many people shuffling around. It feels like it's, like, it, there's too much sunlight on this. Like that mm-hmm. one Oscars where uh, I was at a train station. Woof, we got dark. Actually, entertainment may have been yeah. the darkest part of the pandemic, I'm sorry to say. <laughs> Stay home! Yeah, right. Jeez. Um, oh, the we, excuse me. I worked on a talk show during that time when we filmed interviews over Zoom from home. Woof. Oh, my God. Woof. So shocking to watch back. Every single um, Bravo show that filmed during the pandemic, reality shows like watching Housewives, you sometimes you see flashbacks to these clips and them wearing their masks or not wearing their masks, and but them not wearing them, and all the workers at a restaurant wearing the masks around them. It's it's dark. Oh, it's so unwatchable. It's so something you would never watch again. Anyway, that's something I think about the legacy of the past three years and how we just simply won't think of them for the rest of time. Anyway, okay, this song, The Greatest, also fabulous. I also love the amount of sarcasm in her voice on this album because uh, something that bothers me about Adele is that her music, while of course emotional, rarely has as much personality as she does. Like it rarely gets into like mm-hmm. the funny, like that twerpy humor she has. Whereas Billy gets into that here. And I really love people mm-hmm. who can get funny into the lyrics because I feel like that has a different kind of resonance when you're pairing it with emotional music. It just it's a it's a it's a way of truth telling that I think is memorable. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and obviously I really like uh Chihiro, which is yes. Inspired by um, the name of a character from Spirited Away, which I think we've said this on the show before. Um, we, we need to eventually do it before the end of the year, probably. But um, I still need to watch all the Studio Ghibli films because I have not watched any of them. It's a, it's a blind spot for me, too. Of, yeah. And one of my best friends, Doug, keeps reminding me every week. He's like, when are we having our Miyazaki marathon? And I'm like, okay, well, we're going to have one. And I feel like Billy is like... Bitch, you better watch something. So I'm going <laughs> to – I think we're going to start with those, and then we will finally give the listeners the um, Miyazaki episode that they've been begging for. Okay. Well, I have to stop watching these Barbara Stanwyck movies, so you have to actually come and pry them out of my cold, dead hands if I'm going to – What are you watching going... now? So, <laughs> I'm in the middle of the 40s. I'm doing a whole bunch. Of st- I just rewatched Double Indemnity. There's a lot going on with me. Sorry, oh, wrong well, number. I mean... Not a great movie. Double Indemnity, that air, honestly, I would love to see Billy in a noir film. Well, like again, that. we we talked about her on that show, Swarm, right? Excuse me, that was not mm-hmm. a normal performance. She was extremely good. A very, I, I'm really excited to see her act more. This, I mean, she might get an Oscar and not just for a song. 
again, you know my theory that she is like Diane Warren, except she can't stop winning Oscars. You know my theory. <laughs> she's gonna have like uh, she's gonna have like seventeen in her hands and be like, please, please leave me alone. I'm a child. I want to go to grad school. Who are the people who have Oscars for um, song? Who would be comparable to her for yes for Barbara Streisand? For the yeah. Oscars, yeah. Mm-hmm. And then Cynthia Erivo was nominated twice in one year for um, her song from uh, uh, Harriet and the movie Harriet, and I believe that also happened to Mary J. Blige too. Remember when we nominated her for okay. an acting Oscar? Yes, she has won an acting Oscar. For Bootstruck, but has she won a song? No, she's never been nominated. Oscar? Girl, Cher's not writing a song. Picture Cher. Cher's like holding a pen. She's like, I don't know what this is. I'm going to bed. You wake me when you're ready. Yeah. They were walking in Memphis and she took she took a car. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she took an Uber. She met them at the destination. <laughs> tell me, tell me about your walk. Right. I'll sing about it. And then, of course, a lot of singers who are nominated for, uh, you know, like Peggy Lee, Once Upon a Time, Bobby Darin. But then those people typically aren't nominated for songwriting, too. Mm, all right. Well, Billy. Um, she nailed it. I love this, love album. this album. It's an A for me. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Uh, absolutely the best um, album that we've heard from her so far. Yep. So um, that's jumping to the top. Of the Ira charts. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, you release your own chart every week. It's demented, but I think you should do it. Yeah. Okay, I think I should do that. Also, and should I release a bubbling under? Yeah. Oh my God, all yeah, every shady chart too. <laughs> the top, the top one hundred, not even close. Yeah. Speaking of bubbling under, Dua Lipa hit number one on the bubbling <laughs> under charts. A single of hers did. It really did. Oh. At, not being shady. No. Um, and But I do want to say the album, though, remember when we presupposed that she was just making music for the UK um, and would just ignore the US for the rest of her career? I don't know. It seems likely because this album was her biggest debut in the UK. And it went and it debuted at number one, sold more than Future Nostalgia did. Right. No. Uh, and look. Kylie stays over there, generally speaking, for a reason. Like they like to have a good time yeah. and dance around. Whereas here, we yeah. find that suspicious. So, listen, it is exactly what you said about the Billboard charts last week when we were talking about Song of the Summer, right? When you go to, if you go to sort of a straight leaning bar or any sort of public space in the U.S., the songs that you're hearing, it's a mixed mash of genres, is very annoying. When you are in the U.K. and someone is playing pop music. You're going to be hearing bobs. Oh, yeah. No, it's everything is, if not girls allowed, people who tried to write for girls allowed. Yeah. (laughs) Uh, Which is to say that I've actually been listening to Radical Optimism on repeat as well lately. The album has dug its nails into me. So it was definitely a grower um, for me. And I kind of really love it. And I think I would upgrade the album to a B. Um, I like the swimmy nautical vibes of it, but I would say I'm like a nautical pessimist about that album as, as, <laughs> as far as it playing it again and again goes. Okay. You're trying it in maritime court. Yeah, yes, that's right. That's right. <laughs> All right. When we are back, we will be joined by Prentice Penny. I'd call this guest the head of Hollywood's cookout, so to speak, from show running HBO's iconic series Insecure to helming projects like Uncorked and Pause with Sam J, to also writing on Girlfriends back in the day. And today he's here to talk about his new Hulu docuseries, Black Twitter, A People's History, based on Jason Parham's original Wired article, A People's History of Black Twitter, Part 1. Welcome to Keep It, Prentice Petty. Hey, how you guys doing? Uh, amazing. And I have to say about this project, the idea of putting this together feels unbelievably daunting to me because it's just how how many voices can you possibly add in one documentary uh first of all and then also just thinking about twitter historically feels like a migraine immediately so i want to that you would even broach it feels very (laughs) crazy is it was it as daunting to you to begin this project yes and uh my my wife was like it's one of those things where it's like it's a thankless kind of a thankless thing because there's no way you can satisfy obviously everybody's 
appetite for what they feel black Twitter is. And not, obviously, and nor can we, we're not a monolith, right? So um, it's such a dense subject matter that trying to get everything in there. That's why this, we try to say this isn't like a definitive doc. It's just a doc. And hopefully there'll be more and, and talking because you could talk about so many different subject matters just in Black Twitter. You could talk about political things. You could talk about pop culture things. You could talk about, you know, societal things. You can talk about tech. There are so many things uh, that Black Twitter touches on. So trying to get everything is almost impossible. Mm -hmm. You know, what's, what's so interesting about this project, um, being involved in it and then also, um, you know, seeing it air and seeing the response to it. It's sort of like you said, it's um, you can't really get into um, how everyone feels black Twitter is every person who's ever been a part of it. And obviously black people not being a monolith, you know, you just sort of tell the story that you're specifically trying to tell with the people who are available to you. And I have to wonder, that's a thing that I feel like you probably encountered within your career so many times. I mean, I can think back to insecure uh, the conversations that would happen about that show every week online um and then even um something like girlfriends you know i wonder what that was like um in the day as it was airing you know there wasn't the internet and black twitter but were you also conscious of how people specifically black women were responding to that show each week um and how did that also inform how you wrote stories then it didn't really inform how we wrote stories but definitely once people found out i wrote for the show Oh, it was lots of thoughts and opinions, uh, a ton of them. Uh, so yeah, but it was just in real time. But it was just in real time. It wasn't the like you know the endless scroll of you know a ton of opinions. You were just like, oh, if you've heard someone heard somebody somebody found this out, um, then that would be a one thing. You know what I mean? Um, but yeah, but definitely lots of even now people still have lots of thoughts and opinions. You know, and I'm like that was 20 years ago. But yeah. Well, speaking of insecure, <laughs> I mean, like the reactions to that show. I mean, it, it, it felt like. Twitter possessed that show in a way after a while, like it like half of half of the show was you watch the show and then you had to see what everybody was saying about it online. I, 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 even though you're the showrunner and, you know, you're on one side of the TV, were there opinions you read that you could not shake that were still on your mind as you were help creating the show, specific tweets that would pop off or anything to you? No, I, it, you know, what's so funny is like when you're you know, when we first were making this show, and, and Issa, I think, is a specific kind of person because she is of that generation where, like, you know, being like social media was such an important part and such an important part of growing her brand of Awkward Black Girl and, and people weighing in on that on YouTube and, and growing that. So there's a part of it that I think um, the show just naturally had associations with based on the previous incarnation of what the show was. Right. Uh, but when we were making the show, you're the first season. Nobody knew what we were. Nobody knew what we were going to be. Nobody knew who the cast was really besides Issa. So we were kind of like in a little bubble, like doing our own little thing, like playing with our toys in a corner. And then obviously it's successful, but we just kind of kept saying, let's just keep playing with our toys in the corner and hopefully people will like the things we're doing. When you start to like kind of chase the tail, I think that was like a, a weird way. The only time we would ever like look to that is if something didn't feel clear. Like I remember the most times that we, but it's nothing we could do about it now. The show's already out done. But the most things that we would do would be like, oh, we didn't, we weren't super clear if he was in an open marriage or we could have been more just precise about this, but not like altering stories, just more so, ah, oh, we didn't give the audience enough information about something. Mm -hmm. And then I have to wonder, you know, in conceiving Black Twitter, um, the documentary, um, what was, I guess, the first inclination were there any inclinations or ideas you had about presenting this that you had to throw out um and didn't really work once you were producing it or things that you maybe had to reshift from how you thought the narrative was going to be before you even sat down to edit it because i remember you know sitting down for an interview for it um like a year ago you know um end of last mm -hmm. year and um yeah. so much has changed about i mean it's not even called twitter anymore you know, uh, so there's that too. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of things changed that weren't in the original thing. The one thing that I will say is, is we were adapting it from Jason's article, which uh, which in some ways gave us, a, I feel, a really good foundational place to start. You know what I mean? As opposed to like 
kind of taking it out of no kind of taking it out of thin air and being like, oh, we're gonna just make this be a doc. It gave us, I feel, it gave us a foundation of a lot of things. One, it gave us an act structure because his article has three his three parts to it, right? Which helped me as a narrative filmmaker be like, oh, stories, a classic story has three acts. So this gives me something to kind of work with. Um, it gave us people to talk to initially without kind of having to be like, oh my God, where do we even remotely start from, right? He had done, Jason had done so much work. And as, as I'm trying to find, for me, it was, I didn't know what the story was, right? Which is different than just taking an article. I didn't really know. I was like, if you can just Google it, that's not an interesting story. That's just a fact. But that's not anything that I'm giving you extra past, just again, reading the article. So for me, it was talking to Jason, having so much information and rec and as I was putting it through a narrative filter, I kept thinking, oh, this was like a coming of age story where like in a typical coming of age story, if you think about Star Wars or Stand By Me or any movie where it's like a young person is, is new, figuring it out. It all feels fun. It all feels interesting. It feels, it's like, what is this? And then something dark happens that becomes like a more grown up theme that now the hero has to deal with, right? Like in Star Wars, it's like Luke learns Obi-Wan is killed. And now he has to like take a darker turn into a journey of becoming a Jedi. And what does that mean, right? And you're just dealing with more adult themes and ideas, right? Um, and that's what it was for Black Twitter. It was like reading his article, the first the first act of the article was like the fun and the live tweeting and the memes and the gifts. And it's like all fun. And then Trayvon is sort of the first thing that like takes it into a darker place. And now what is our hero? If our hero is Black Twitter, what is Black Twitter going to do in the face of Oscar So White, in the face of uh, a president like Donald Trump, in the face of a pandemic? What is it going to do in these moments? Is it going to is it going to shrink? Is it going to rise? And that became kind of the journey. The, and then the other thing that happened, obviously, is Elon <laughs> buying the platform. And that, you know, it didn't, it actually, I feel in a it, sad for the platform, good for the story. It it crystallized, one, it gave us a villain, which <laughs> is like, it gives you a, a personal, as opposed to like in the doc right now, there's lots of things that are kind of forces, right? It's like the alt-right Trump is a force. There's a lot of different things, but somebody who's coming in literally trying to destroy the platform in which all this social change is happening on and all this community is happening on just gives you, uh, uh, if it's Star Wars, you're like, oh, that's the emperor. That's the final boss, essentially, right? Um, and so it just gave us, and it just was made Jason's instinct to write the article more prophetic because he was like, so many things are here today, gone tomorrow. And then- it is gone as as gone as we know it. You even just revisiting these like four or five like landmark horrifying moments on Twitter. It's like it, I congratulate you for making this because even thinking about I'm like, oh, my God, it was so bracing to just see people commenting on it, et cetera. Were there any moments of pure pleasure revisiting the hilarity within the community of black Twitter that you most cherished working on this? Yes, a ton. And that was the that was the fun thing is like, you know, black culture is always uh, I think Raquel says this is always kind of having two conversations, right? There's the there's the obvious conversation we're having if it's about Trayvon or a subject matter or something serious. But then there's the way that we've used we've had to use humor to cope with those things. Right. Then there's the other the underside of that. Right. So then there is the comedy of we had like a longer segment about Rachel Dolezal and appropriation. We had fun, obviously, the stuff about like the memes and gifts is fun. But even like the Nigger Navy stuff was so fun to revisit the verses, like just remembering mm. all the verses jokes that were happening, all the pandemic jokes that were happening, like even in the face of like watching something that's just still triggering. <laughs> that's just four years ago. It's still like, man, we were we're so funny. Like, I really wanted to get the thing about the uh, that that uh, DJ Marquise who did the coronavirus. Like, I was like, that's. <laughs> how we cope with it. We were, and so revisiting that and getting those things was so much fun just to remember. Uh, yeah. Even in the midst of all that, we were still finding ways to laugh and, and, and have fun and have, and have, and have community. Mm -hmm. um, how do you sort of respond, I guess, to um, even the overwhelming sense that, um, you know, the narrative obviously is about how black Twitter, if it's the protagonist of this story, how it's responding to these um, various things that's happening throughout history leading up to Elon Musk um, being, you know, sort of the final boss. Um, but, you know, when you're watching the documentary, you are seeing people, you know, sort of like myself or, you know, like, um, you know, um, other people who have sort of been able to gain, I guess, a sense of um, 
notoriety um, even from the website or are able to gain careers or maybe to have their voices pushed out further. And do you feel like that gives a sense of the idea of like Black Twitter being successful, even though it feels almost like um, there's so many people within Black Twitter who I guess don't get the opportunity to, you know, change their voice online into a career you know i feel like it's a small group of people so did you feel like you i don't know you were telling sort of like a journalist slash comedians like or actors like story of black twitter versus i guess sort of like someone in their home in ohio you know but i think that's but i i think those are synonymous in lots of ways right like i I don't Mm -hmm. like to me like someone like kashawn thompson who is someone who's like someone in Ohio would just like tweeted black girl magic. It's like, she's not reaping the financial benefit of creating something that is Mm -hmm. now something that's on t-shirts and and all those other things, but her platform and activism is huge, right? Somebody like April. So rain is saying Oscar. Mm -hmm. So white is changing movements. And and then, and then, and then as a result, there's like secondarily uh, impact that comes from that, right. And resonance that comes from that. So I view everything that happened on black Twitter that is positive like that as a success, right? Because anytime that pre that I was like, well, we, we, like we weren't a galvan, we weren't, let me say this. I, I don't know the level of galvanization. I don't know what percentage that is. Right. But I know we weren't at where we were pre black Twitter. Right. And so when I think about all the things that did come out of that, all the connections that were made, all the impact that was made, whether it's comedic, whether it's serious, all those things I think are, they didn't exist before. And I think as I've gotten older, I've learned to be like, am I making something better than when I got there? Right. And that's how I view success. Right. It doesn't always, it, I don't know if it's 1%, 2%, but if it's better than where it was, then that's a win. And so I feel like the world is better um, post black Twitter than when it got there. Right. And so I just think that's a win. And I, was saying this earlier, I was like, you know, my kids are TikTok kids. They're, they've never been on Twitter. They're 16, they're 14. They're never going to, they're not even going to be literally on Twitter. Right. But they move in the world with like black Twitter energy. Right. Because they've only grown up hearing phrases like black lives matter, black girl magic, black boy joy. Right. So they, they are just used to hearing that as a mantra. I didn't hear that growing up. Right. A lot of my stuff was my grandparents telling me, obviously you have to do, you know, twice as good as anybody else, but also like you got to play the game, you got to do this. And there's always a part of that in black culture in America for sure. But there was, I think when I was coming up, there was much more like you got to assimilate and get like, and kids today are like, no, nah, I'm gonna wear my hair how I want to wear my hair. Or I'm gonna, I'm not gonna, I'm, if I want braids, I'm gonna get braids. I'm not gonna have to worry like, how is that gonna look in a white corporate set? You know what I mean? Where those were real things for a long time. I'm like, they just move unapologetically black. And I 100% know that's because of the things that were happening on black Twitter. Now, you mentioned TikTok, which, you know, would be the next maybe evolution of this. But in this world where Twitter or whatever it's called now is so treacherous and led by, you know, Bowser himself, (laughs) if it just imploded and stopped working tomorrow, (laughs) would you feel optimistic about like this, I, I, for lack of a better term, community moving to something like TikTok, what would be lost specifically if there wasn't Twitter? I mean, I still think we would lose something. I don't think that, I don't think like nothing would be lost. And I don't think it's a natural migration to just be like, oh, we'll, we'll all go to TikTok. Cause there's certain people like, I'm not, I I look at things on TikTok, but I'm not like on it like that at my, I'm 50. So I'm not just like on it like that in the way that like somebody in their twenties or teens or whatever is going to be on the, on the platform. And I don't think it's as simple as just social media, um, social media app, a everybody migrates there. Um, I, I think the, I think the, I guess I feel like I'm seeing a lot more black Twitter energy in real life um, in terms of just how we call out institutions or how we stand up or how we're like, nah, we're not going for that. Or like even recently, even over the weekend with, uh, was it Senator Crockett or Congresswoman Crockett and Mm. uh, Marty Taylor Mm Greene going at it, right? And the thing is like, she brought black Twitter energy. Like it wasn't like black Twitter commented on the Marjorie Taylor Greene thing. She commented on that energy in real time. Then black Twitter took it making beats, making songs. Now Marjorie Taylor Greene is posting her working out in her garage talking about, I'm I'm just trying to be a good American. I'm like, you just saw 
you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene came into Congress one way, she left a different way, right? And I feel like that's when I see like, oh, you're seeing black Twitter energy in real life and then black Twitter responds. But if that's five years ago, that would be, black Twitter would be like getting the jokes off. You know what I mean? So that's what I mean when I'm seeing. So I don't, I think something would be lost for sure because we still are gathering on the platform. But I, I don't know if like, because black people weren't looking for Twitter. It was like the 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 mashup of it just worked uh, because of what the platform allowed. And there's lots of reasons why I think that happened. But I don't I don't think I don't know. It could be 30 something years that something else happens that we don't even know exists yet. Right. Because we didn't know that was going to be the thing that was going to like galvanize in this community. Things were going to happen here. So I think it'll be something we don't even know yet or see yet. Well, she is selling those shirts now, so she did learn from Black Girl Magic, I guess, to get her check <laughs> herself. Um, I want to ask, uh, lastly, um, you've had, you know, the pleasure of working and show running, you know, shows with um, Black creatives, Black actors, um, you know, amazing people like Issa Rae, Sam Jay. Um, and seeing them get to get their have their stories um, sort of told, you know, um, in a way that you haven't been able to. I mean, when you were working with Mara, uh, obviously on Girlfriends, you were able to see some of that too. But um, w were there any positive experiences that you remember, you know, when you were, I want to say, in the trenches, jokingly, you know, on shows like Happy Endings or Scrubs, where you know you're in um, rooms that are not largely black. You're just working through the industry until you get this opportunity again where you've had your career now. Were there any moments from, I guess, shows like that where you like maybe it felt like you were heard as a black person or you were able to um, positively sort of um, change something about black characters um, within the show that people did not see before, but they listened to you and you felt like, oh, I have a place within this industry? Yeah, I mean, I would say... And I've been very blessed uh, in terms of the writers, the showrunners that I work with that were in non-Black rooms, which was pretty much all of my career except Girlfriends and Insecure, <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, you know, working on Scrubs <laughs> and Brooklyn Nine-Nine and Happy Endings and shows like that. Uh, that was that was most of it. Um, but they were, inc but I've had friends of mine that were on other shows that were basically told you're here to be a number and kind of keep quiet, but that was never... Um, that was never my experience on any of those shows, not once. I mean, I feel like they were always asking me what now, now the roommate out of reflected that, but in terms of certainly, uh, I never had to feel like I had to like, uh, defend what a black character would do or why it would, I just think like, I don't know, maybe it, I was there. And so they just, they knew me and they were just like, we're not even, but the people weren't even like that and you know what I mean so I never had those kind of mm -hmm. moments it was but it, it was always like here's the nuance of this or here's a nuance of that um you know Brooklyn was one of the was one of the best ones I, I had uh such a great time because that cast was so diverse that was the first time I had worked primarily what I would say in an all white writers room with the exception of a few people um uh, where the cast though was reflective of that, right? Because like when I was on Scrub, Donald Faison was the only black person, the happy endings, Damon Wayans Jr. was the only black person. But on Brooklyn, it was Terry Cruz, Andre Brower, uh, Melissa Fumero as a, as a Latinx, uh, Stephanie Beatrice, obviously. So, you know, four of the seven main cast members were people of color, right? So um, that just, and obviously Andre Brower's there, he not playing with no foolishness so um uh so a lot of that just kind of kept things you know a lot of things a lot of things Andre did a lot of heavy lifting I didn't have to do but um but no I, I never had anything like that to me it was just always finding the nuances of stuff that would be like oh but he he might say it like this or he might do it like this or this might be the thought process not the thought process from where you're thinking of but but never but I never I was again really blessed but a lot of those things is when I learned too that like you know, you got to play in those sandboxes too, because that's where the big deals were happening. Like, had I not gotten on Brooklyn Nine Nine, that's where I met um, David Miner, who was a producer and was the manager for um, Mike Shore, uh, was at a company called Three Arts, and that's where Issa's managers were at, which is Three Arts. And so, again, I could I could see David Miner every day and say, "Hey, do you mind putting in a word with me with your business partner?" 
<laughs> to get on this other show as a showrunner. And he was like, of course. And he made that call like immediately. And I got an interview the next day and then got the job. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I still had to do the job and do the interview, yeah. but it makes a difference when you're like, you know what I mean? Where it's like, oh, you can pick up the phone and call your mm-hmm. best friend and give me an interview. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, that's what I've learned. Like, okay, yeah. there's a different. Now, and then, you know, you just learn that there's just a there's just a bigger ecosystem. And you're like, how do I stop now playing that ecosystem? Because that's where the all the things are moving. And then again, you can extrapolate that to business. You can extrapolate that to all these things, right? And so that's when you go like... That's the real. That's the real. Disca- that's the real discrepancy. I think sometimes we often think about wealth, which is obviously is a big one, but opportunity opportunity discrepancies are huge. Um, that I just got to see. I, I just got to see what it was really like on the inside. What I'll say. I don't think we've done a full emotional debriefing on Andre Brower not being here anymore. What an incredible performance on that show. It was hilarious, and then like the shock moments of gravitas on that show too. So good. So well placed. Yeah, he was awesome and just a good dude. And I, I tell Andre, people, I think I was like, I was like, Andre Brower was a brother. Like, I'm like, I used to love, there were times where he would just want to make white crew members uncomfortable as just a joke. It was just the funniest. I was like, if people saw that Andre Brower, it, it was like, this is not the I say Andre Brower of who he's playing as Holt. I was like, he's more like the Andre Brower and get on the bus where he's like giving everybody a hard time. That was more the Andre Brower that, that, that I was surprised to see and be like, oh, he's from the South Side of Chicago. Oh, that makes sense. <laughs> uh, well, thank you so much for being here. Um, and thank you for, of course, involving me um, in even a small part of the documentary. I've gotten a lot of texts from people who've been like, what the hell are you doing in this? Uh, so <laughs> that's, that's always fun. That's always fun to get. <laughs> As a as a good thing or as a like why you no it's a good thing it's a good no it's a good thing like I mean I have my questions but yeah it's nice yeah yeah yeah. so thank you for being here you closed the doc out of course I mean you closed the documentary I did yes the final word like Jerry Springer you know Lewis knows I love having the last word (laughs) oh sure yeah love that final thought from you I needed to sleep yeah. Back to Black, the Amy Winehouse biopic that no one was excited for, debuted last weekend, and it flopped. So, I guess Valerie ain't coming on over. <laughs> Valerie's like, my conditions are this. I'm only coming if it makes 50 mil. Yeah. Well, as I stated in the intro, the girl Bravely. put me to sleep, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I did stay uh, up through it. I, okay, here's what I'll say about this. So th- there are problems with this movie, which is I don't think it establishes what the X factor of Amy Winehouse was. You don't come away with the feel of Amy Winehouse. Marissa Abela, who we know from uh, Industry, where she is uh, fabulous mm-hmm. on that show, plays Amy Winehouse here. And she takes a real workmanlike approach to figuring out this role, which is I think she does a pretty good job with the speaking voice of Amy Winehouse. Like, it, you can kind of hear the contrivance, like getting into that really garbled, weird, uh, super British uh, Amy Winehouse voice. But you uh, accept it eventually. You know, I would compare it maybe to Jesse Mueller as Carol King on Broadway. It's like, they don't really sound alike, but now I'm buying it eventually. Mm-hmm. The look, obviously, she doesn't have, like really resemble her uh, from the side i think the producers were a little bit romanced by how she appears in certain profile but to me what she is missing from amy winehouse and i think maybe the reason you would make this movie altogether is the is the energy of amy winehouse like she doesn't have the kind of dangerous kooky very acerbic vibe that amy winehouse had. Like when you watch an amy winehouse interview She'll like toss off a one liner and roll her eyes in a way where it's like, well, this chick is dark and also like, fuck you. It doesn't have to say fuck you. She's like stumbling over and like mumbling fuck you to no one in particular. Um, So I think they didn't really get to the heart of just the weirdness of her as a celebrity to emerge so quickly. And I also didn't think they really explained why she became such a paparazzi figure so quickly. Like she just went from uh, obscurity to famous and people are following her all the time yeah i think that um obviously there's a lot of talk about um how the film doesn't really explain who she is as an artist 
to be honest. And I feel like was was the was the movie at least showing her working on music, or a lot of the reviews that I saw were mostly focused on it deals with her as an addict. Yeah. Or it's like it tells you she's an addict, but then like how she really falls into addiction with Blake, played by Jack O'Connell, who does a fabulous job in the movie. And by the way, her mother is played by, excuse me, Leslie Manville. When she showed up on screen, I said, what? Mrs. Harris goes here? What? (laughs) Well, so you didn't find this movie entirely successful. No, I mean, like, I didn't find it offensive. Like, I thought she gave, like, a a good college try as Amy Winehouse. But it's that thing where, basically, you don't have a reason to make a biopic sometimes unless what you're delivering, first and foremost, is truly an Oscar-winning performance. You know, like, there's Mm -hmm. no reason to make La Vie on Rose unless you're going to deliver such a jarring recollection of Edith Piaf that it feels like, oh, we are experiencing this artist live and so to get something less than that you know like a b performance which is what i think we get in this movie you know that is not enough to compensate for the fact that it's a standard biopic in other ways you know like here she is getting famous she performs at the grammys things get worse for her her dad is worried you know it's just like it's not even as dynamic as a movie like the rose where you get you know bet midler with these convulsive performances this convulsive stage energy you just get this sort of meager and very safe interpretation of amy winehouse Mm -hmm. uh what would you say are some of your favorite ones that you feel like get it you know i mean obviously probably the coal miners donner uh Uh, for loretta lynn Mm -hmm. um a a musical i'm not there i'm not there i hate but i at least they went with something new you know what I mean? Like, here's all these different people's interpretations of it and Kate Blanchett getting to put on, you know, menswear, which is, you know, a quarter of her thing. Um, <laughs> a f- my favorite musical biopic, I'm going to. G- well, I mean, I guess I would say all that jazz, you know, where mm. you have Roy Scheider playing um, Bob Fosse in a movie he's directing about himself. And it's this kooky, dreamlike, uh, uh, tumultuous view inside an artist's head it's extremely self-indulgent but you are very enamored of the self-indulgence while you're in that movie and you also get Anne Reinking um kicking her leg well above her head and into the rafters um Mm -hmm. so I think I would probably say that what would you say is your favorite musical biopic um see I mean I really like Selena oh that's a good one I love Mm -hmm. I love what's love got to do with it a hard watch yeah but don't need to see it again but yeah Mm mm-hmm yeah, um, I would also say Behind the Candelabra was really good. Oh, yeah. I me. mean, we just yeah. we were just talking about um, Rob Lowe, who is the host of uh, The Floor, and he is in that movie. And let's just talk about what kind of Rick Baker makeup ass shit had to go into his face <laughs> to achieve that. I mean, it's like modern art, what his face looks like in Behind the Candelabra. A mm, uh, little underrated, I would say, is... The Doors, to be honest. We don't talk about Oliver Stone that much on this show, but I mean, you either like him or you don't. Uh, I don't like his 9-11 movie, but I like The Doors. And I know you don't like the movie Priscilla, but I like that approach to a biopic, which is obviously it's more about Priscilla than Elvis, but like it's a view into a major celebrity that comes in askew. Again, another movie where I love the idea of it, even though it's not a great movie, is My Week with Marilyn. You get an abbreviated Mm. time with a very famous person coming from one particular perspective that is unique. And we get maybe an insight into this celebrity just by, you know, sheer virtue of being with them for a few days at a time. That's another problem I have with this movie. It doesn't really have a take on Amy Winehouse. It's kind of Mm. just saying, well, isn't it sad? And it's like, well, yeah, I knew that already. Like, you're not you're not explaining that addiction is, you know, horrifying or that Mm -hmm. um, they don't add any context to her that makes it any different. And by the way, I. You know, for like a movie like Judy with Renee Zellweger, she came alive playing the musical sequences in that movie. Really the most impressive part of the movie here when she does musical sequences as Amy Winehouse, you could not be further from Amy Winehouse, the performer. You're not getting any of that like um, kind of gritty, um, determined uh, and and also animalistic thing that Amy Winehouse had going on. They feel like very kind of, you know what it sort of felt like? I'm I'm rambling at this point. I apologize. It felt like you were watching in the years 
after Amy Winehouse got famous on American Idol, there were several like eighth or ninth place contestants who kind of had a rasp in their voice imitating her. And that's mm-hmm. what it feels like you're getting here. And I don't mean any shade to season eight's Megan Joy Corkery or season nine's Dee Dee Banami. But that's what I felt like you were getting in this movie as opposed to Amy Winehouse. Mm-hmm. They all can't be Nikki McKibben. Oh, may she rest. Yeah. On the um, edge of 17 forever. Yeah. Um. Honestly, I want to say what really works, I feel like, is kind of when you don't know the subject. Yeah, totally. You, until you go and um, learn something about them. Um, I would say, so, I mean, people forget that the pianist is a biopic of a musician, you know, right, like a right. person who really existed. Um, and that's a great film. Um, Polanski and Adrian Brody's film. He won for that. And um, it brings me to... I, a musical biopic that I did see this weekend. It was on stage, though. I saw Limpica on Broadway, oh, which was just um, did its last last weekend. Yes. Yeah, it closed early. I saw the final performance. It's electric and sort of sad and despondent to be in a theater knowing that so show is closing earlier, having fans there watching it, um, people on stage knowing that they're delivering a final performance, but it's not a triumph. It's more of a disappointment because it's being um shuttered early uh i enjoyed it it's interesting when you talk about what is it about a show Eden that espinosa yeah. plays the lead nominated for a tony etc yeah she plays limpica who is a art deco artist um you may recognize some of her um paintings of sexy women who are sort of machine like um you've definitely seen a limpica drawing before um if you if you go, if you go and google limpica you you will know her work the problem was that the creators of this were very interested in limpica's um queer story you know obviously she was married uh she and her husband were nobility they fled uh poland uh, because of the bolsheviks um and she sort of had to um get her husband out of prison so that they could escape to Paris. And then she became an artist. And we don't know much about her relationship with Raffaella, the muse for seven of her paintings, but they are very sexy, um, very nude. Um, it's this woman that she had an affair with. And they focus a lot on, you know, this queer story, the queer um, rebellious nature of these women. You know, there's a song, a lot of songs about like being modern women of the time of the twenties and there's sort of a, you meet someone who owns a jazz bar um, named Sue, who is um, creating a place for femmes and non-binary people, you know, queer people to sort of be themselves, et cetera, you know, very cabaret esque. But I went home and looked this up and it's, first of all, the owner of that bar, there's, there's a scene in act two where it's, um, the the fascists come in and they sort of want to destroy the bar. They're like, you need to get out of here. And she's like, no, I'm standing, st- I'm standing strong. You know, like I'm creating this beautiful place for these people. And turns out that bitch was a Nazi. Oh, okay. We left that out. Oops. Yeah, we left that <laughs> out. Uh, <laughs> okay. So, and there's other aspects of Lapika where um, she was kind of a cunt to her daughter. Um, and she really sort of was a machine in, in creating art, and she cared about art more than people. And I don't know. I think that a lot of her was sanitized to tell this sort of um, glad um, uh, approved story, that, story. People would, yes. yeah, mm-hmm. that people, you know, were, there were people in the audience waving pride flags. You know, I think it was made a feel good queer story for women, which I'm not opposed to. But if you're telling the life of a woman, I think that really existed, who was a complicated woman. Um, I don't know, the producers, the director talked a lot about how Broadway wasn't ready for a story about complicated women um, and queer love stories um, in their speeches at the end. And I don't know, when you find out that the woman was a lot more complicated than you chose to depict on stage, I don't know if I exactly believe you, you know? Yeah, right, right, right. Also, it's just like... What's the danger of making it even more interesting? Sorry. I mean, like, I know you're yeah. not trying to shape a narrative, but like the, the 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 true history of it is probably the most fascinating part of it. So, 
And it's more interesting to get you to care about a character who isn't completely likable all the time. You know, there's a moment in the show where there's a there's a baron and a baroness who are sort of her benefactors um, for a large part of the play. And actually, when she leaves Paris and goes to Hollywood, the Baron becomes her second husband um, after the Baroness dies. And the play sort of ends with um, she doesn't have her lover because she won't run away with her. And she doesn't have her husband because her husband decides to leave her and go back to Warsaw with a new woman. And the Baroness is dying. And there's a beautiful final song. Uh, the music is very beautiful, I would say. Um, there's a beautiful final song where the Baroness is sort of like, take my husband, uh, give him a companion for the later parts of his life because I'm dying and I want you to paint this beautiful portrait of me, etc. Right? Turns out, Limpika would have been fucking the Baron for most of that <laughs> marriage. So the Baron was already having an affair with her. So what's made to be this beautiful moment at the end, it's like, she was a hussy. And which, I but, which so. by the way, you could have just called the show that she was a hussy. I'm already in. <laughs> uh, so I think there was this story about a woman who was messy and complicated and treated the people in her life sort of horribly, but was devoted to her art. And I think that's a much more interesting story. And I think the same thing sort of happens when you do biopics of people like an Amy Winehouse or something, right? They are people who had issues and problems within their life and real sort of dark struggles that people just kind of don't want to depict when they make these biopics because they want them to be feel good. They want them to appeal to every demographic coming to see this film. Right. It just has to be sanitized ultimately, as opposed to, the, you know, not everything can be uh, gr grittily real and uh, three hours long or something. So I'm, I'm sympathetic to the idea that they have to make like a saleable narrative anyway, but it's just, if we're talking about Amy Winehouse, I just think there are lots of character shades there that were totally missed that made her interesting um, uh, immediately when you saw her. Mm -hmm. uh, all right, when we're back, keep it. And we're back with our favorite segment of the episode. It is Keep It. Lewis. Yes. What's yours? My Keep It is to um, a television series. I like, will always uh, like, which is RuPaul's Drag Race. We're in the All Stars season mm. um, 77. Um, I don't know if you know this. There's actually more All Stars than cast members now. Um, I don't know how it's done. Um, congrats to them. My keep it is to the fact that um, the show, which is enjoyable, and I'm loving everybody on it, we're currently rooting for Plastique Tierra, who is. Um, mm -hmm. a, you, you can't stop watching her. She's unbelievable looking and has fabulous moves, fabulous drag queen. Unfortunately, this is a format where they're playing for charity, and so like mm -hmm. uh, s certain previous installments, nobody's getting eliminated on this version of All Stars. They play every week, and everybody's eligible to win every challenge. But what this also means is that the judges sitting at the panel, for whatever reason, we don't hear them criticize them. It's just pure compliments from the entire panel. Girl, this Get is like my here. favorite part of the episode. Like, I can't just be watching people compliment other people. It's not good TV. Who wants to see that? Like, Michelle uh, Visage feels totally defanged if she can't be, you know, even even the least bit critical. Um, you know, the hilarious Ross, Ross Matthews is a little less hilarious if he can't be insulting. Just a big part of the show mm. is the shady feel you get from the judges. And I, it's it, it makes me want to fast forward through that entire part of the episode and, like, there's almost you don't even need to watch beyond the runway really because it doesn't really matter who wins mm. maybe because he's not being critical of the queens is why he's been critical of palestine protesters at the glad awards <laughs> you know um. he's like i'll make up for it this way yeah <laughs> um it is annoying and i've heard the tea on this season too uh, and this is the problem with listening to people who are drag queens and who are joining a reality show, right? The T is none of these girls wanted to be sent home. Right. You know? None, none of them wanted to, like, have their... If they're coming back for all-stars, they don't want their camera time dismin diminished. And they don't want the critiques of them. But then it's sort of like, well, bitch, why are you doing the show? Yeah, right. I know you're doing it so that you can get back, um, so you can get more fans again, have people talking about you online, sell some merch, book some gigs, etc. But... I don't know. It's just all very 
lame. Yeah, it's just not in the spirit of drag to me. You know, it's just like if mm-hmm. if you walk in looking fabulous and and sensational stage presence, and you jump into a perfect split, whatever, I will still find something mean to say about you. Watch me. That is the thrill of being alive. <laughs> Maybe Roxy Andrews was telling us the theme of the season when she said, baby, you can't read the doll. <laughs> it's in the contract. You actually can't read the doll. You'll be sent to Guantanamo. Clause, yeah. clause 32. Yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, I have to get into this season still, but that's disappointing to hear, you know, because the whole that's the whole point of drag, which is to say, maybe this will be one of the first seasons where I'm actually tuned in to Pit Stop. Yes. Um, the each week where some other queens, previous queens, critique the series. Uh, I know Violet Chachki is doing today's episode, and uh, I'm sure she's going to have some shit to say. I, oh, by the way, I was at a party over the weekend, like a warehouse party, and Violet Chachki was there out of drag. Forgive me, I don't know Violet mm. Chachki's real name. I, I'm sorry, this is such an elementary observation. I just cannot believe these people are regular gay dudes. You just like, like yeah. in, in some other version of the world, you're like Cher. And then like, I see you in person <laughs> and you're like, queen in exactly my jeans. It's just like, you you can't be a human being too. It just doesn't work out in my head. I'm, not, I'm never there. Yeah. Um, Violet Shot, she was in drag with Got Mick last week uh, when I was out with Aquaria uh, at Paul's Baby Grand in New York. So it's, it's, it's fun to see that switch up back to, back and forth it's sort of a good part of fame maybe you yeah. can sort of vanish unless people recognize you i don't know i was at lebane once and jada as this hall was walking by and i clocked that it was her and i was like hey <laughs> milwaukee girl uh, <laughs> oh yeah you're the inside uh, edge on that everyone, one yeah, but not every one of these queens is instantly recognizable out of their drag especially once their season isn't currently airing you right, know? right, right. By the way, Gottmik also looked fabulous that episode. I do not mean to yeah. dismiss the talents of Gottmik, who was sensational. Ira, what is your keep it this no. week? Uh, my keep it this week, uh, we haven't really talked about this on the show because, I mean, it's dark as hell. Um, but keep it to Diddy this week. Oh, as if we needed to say video- that. Jesus Christ. I know. Yeah. Well, I know. Commenters on YouTube or just online saying, why haven't you had a keep it to Diddy yet? I mean, did, did you think we were pro Diddy? <laughs> it's, it's, it's an absurd idea. Yeah. Every time you do that Godzilla song with the Led Zeppelin riff, I knew something was up. Do you think that Bad Boy for Life is ranking so high on the IRA charts <laughs> that I was like, you know what? Maybe we got to give them another chance, you know? Um, <laughs> the, the, only, <laughs> the only thing I've actually been sad about is... How he besmirches uh, songs by female artists that I love. You know, I, I want to listen to "Come to Me" um, featuring him and Nicole Scherzinger. Uh, I want to listen to his Christina Aguilera song. I want to listen to his Keisha Cole song. You know, um, these women need to. That's why women should always drop solo versions of songs that they do with men. No, and or or release a version with another woman as uh, Lady Gaga did with Christina Aguilera <laughs> brilliantly. Brilliantly. Yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. that, do do I what you want. That original song. I know. I mean unfortunately he did kill that verse. Yeah. Yeah, and, and for, well unfortunately it just it's it's slimy. The whole era of that an art pop was slimy and gross. Um and then it, it's just a completely different song with Christina Aguilera. You know, I mean, and I say that because wasn't she shooting with Terry Richardson then too? Right, right, quite. <laughs> the whole art pop era was just a commentary on art and pop and fame. And I don't know, she was probably high as hell <laughs> during the entire production of that album. Yeah, right. <laughs> anyway, but um, yeah, it's it's a lost era of time, to be honest. Certainly. Uh, uh, very lost, because she didn't even release that on video, did she? No, I don't think so. But I will the say- art pop tour? But, but, um, to get back to Diddy, the idea that- he would then emerge with an apology video. Excuse me? Like, you think you needed that's a comment? What, Excuse me? That's what the keep it is to. The keep it is to his apology video where it's, where the fuck is this nigga? Bali or something? <laughs> yeah, it's, it, not it's, giving, it's not giving this hemisphere, no. <laughs> it's, it's giving wherever the movie Glass <laughs> Onion is, yeah. <laughs> Janelle Monet. go yeah. and set his house on fire. No, she's at WeHo Pride. She's, she's, she's too busy, yeah. <laughs> 
She took. She switched places with Tadashi. Right. She has the code to the basement. She lets her in and out. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You, you, an apology video while you're on vacation. Come on. Not very convincing. Yeah. It's in the world of the like um, Kevin Spacey um, one uh, apology statements and two creepy Christmas videos where it's just oh you think us seeing your face will help out right now. Because I'm telling you, um, I'm already having trouble sleeping thinking of you, let alone with your fucking creepy visage in my life. Shout out to the people who are recently saying that Kevin Spacey, the, the industry needs him. <laughs> For Sharon what? Stone, Liam Neeson, and some other bitches, I'm sure, endorse Kevin Spacey coming back to cinema. Because we need rappers like him, I guess. Sharon! First of all... Your basic instincts are off. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Your total recall uh, of events relating to the traumas of Kevin Spacey is not there. But also, Shia LaBeouf is at Cannes, so... Who, I believe, has yet to stand trial for what uh, the FKA Twig situation. Yeah, it's this year. So, um, I don't know. There's a lot of that going on. And to get back to the ditty of it all, the Savology video obviously came because we s saw a video, well... Some people saw it. I purposefully avoided the oh, video yeah. of him um, be beating up Cassie uh, in a hotel a hallway. Um, it was all over the timeline. And I was like, I don't need everybody retweeting this. Uh, a lot of people were. And I just turned off the internet that day. But obviously this video came after there was irrefutable proof that he did um, beat up Cassie. And this was in public, by the way. So, um, not even to say what happened, you know, behind closed doors in their home. Yeah, it's surveillance the video footage. Just sounds, yes. Yeah, it's surveillance footage. Uh, so, it sounds very, okay, well, now I'm sorry about it. And before you claimed it didn't happen. So Yeah, you never anyway. would have copped to it otherwise. I mean, it's just, I mean, it, it, it's such a first thought thing that it feels like it shouldn't even need to be said. But, like, clearly, like, where would she even be if this video hadn't been produced? Which, by the way, is another layer of trauma that we're seeing this happen to her. It's so fucking horrible. Anyway, that's, it's a very sad situation all around. Um, and I don't know. I hope Cassie is doing well. I love her. Imagine, imagine what that year would have been like without me and you. Excuse me. Did, did I, I believe that was a course I took in college. It was like an entire semester of my <laughs> life at the University of <laughs> Iowa. Long way to go. I mean, the way my friends in college and I used to say that line in the song, try to take me out to dinner, I cancel it all the time. Perfect song. Yeah. Perfect line. We celebrate her, her discography. We will be coming back to it. I think that's our show this week. Woof, we covered a lot. I'm frankly exhausted. Yeah. Um, I'm not. You know, I got, a good, I got a good nap in during Back to Black. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. You've never been better. You're downright refreshed. <laughs> I am going to watch the film eventually and share some thoughts on it, I'm sure, on this podcast at some point. But I will be waiting for it to go to streaming. Okay. Um, and in the meantime, look up the hits of Leslie Manville. Uh, get back to the Phantom Thread. Oh, I am always watching the Phantom Thread. Short movie, delicious movie. Fuck yes to Phantom Thread. Yeah, and honestly, there's a bunch of other Leslie Manville films that I feel like I probably have another seen year. Before. Oh my god, she's sensational. She's sensational. Yeah, uh, I'm also always rewatching. Secrets and Lies, and I'm probably due for a rewatch soon. So. She, she has a, a bit part in that, but Secrets and Lies, one of the great... That's when we used to have Best Picture nominees that were like, fuck yes, Once Upon a Time. 1996, Brenda Blethyn, Marianne John Baptiste, one of our favorites. That's like one of the... It's in the Eve's Bayou category of Keep It favorites. Like, it, it, we'll be mentioning it forever. Yeah. All right. Thank you to Princess Penny for joining us, and we will see you next week. <laughs> <laughs>